be boring, but his guests aren't. It's Al's Boring Podcast. Oh, hi there. Al Dukes here, and my guest today on the podcast is Jason Gay. Hi there, Jason. Hey. How are you, Al? You are a um, sports columnist with the Wall Street Journal. Yep. I was reading your bio. You have worked, uh, you've done pieces for Rolling Stone Magazine. Yes, sir. GQ. Yep. What else? I wrote them down. Vogue. You a big Vogue, Vogue reader? I'm Al? not a big Vogue reader. <laughs> uh, the New York Observer. Yeah. And you have a new book out called The Little Victories, Perfect Rules for Imperfect Living. That's and, true. And I got this book sent to me here at the radio station. And I normally throw the books right in the garbage because most of them <laughs> are just terrible. I don't know how a lot of books get uh, made. Like yeah. I'll, get, I'll get a lot of weird books like about like a particular, like a here's a book on a golfer. Yeah. Here's a book, who's better, Peyton Manning or Tom Brady. Sure. How many... Oh, do people buy these books? Not your book in particular. I'm saying the bad books well, that I get. Well, first of all, Al, you're awfully nice to have picked up my book in the first place. Yeah, I didn't throw and, it out. And, and, you know, at the Wall Street Journal and every other place I've worked, there's always that slightly depressing pile of yeah. unattended books, yes. right? You know, that just collects and collects. And you feel guilty throwing out a book, yes. right? You're yeah, not supposed like to do it. It's like cover food. Thing. It's like you're not supposed to throw it out. It's a yeah. sin. And yet they collect and they collect. I, I'm here to tell you, Al, people are still... Buying books, thankfully, they're buying little victories. This is my first book, but uh, I'm I'm honored that uh, you know you have a busy day. You have a lot to choose from. As how do you feel your busy day that you chose to read Little Victories? I did, and I'll tell you when I uh, when I looked at it, I thought this is a book I could handle. Right? I like like each chapter is an individual chapter. Yeah, that's my biggest problem with books is that. I'll, I'll read a book, I'll put it down, and then I'm like, no, wait, who was Billy? <laughs> what did Billy do? Can I level with this you about perfect. some? Yeah, can I level with you yes. about an honest truth? And it's in the book, okay? This is not some sort of, like, industrial secret. I wanted a book that, A, you could pick up at any part. You could sort of open it to any section, and you'd get a laugh out of it, which are those are the kinds of books that I loved yes. when I was growing up. And then the other thing, and I'm completely honest about this, Put that thing in the can, you know? It's perfect for the bathroom because you could do one chapter every time you have to sit down <laughs> for a prolonged period. Now, I read it when I was watching the Jet game this past weekend. Okay. Because as much as we say we love football, yeah. there, it is kind of boring. Like, there's a lot of stop in the action. Uh, the Jets were out of it early. No one was moving the ball. And I read a, m the majority of the book while watching the Jet game. Well... I hope the game, the, the the book was more entertaining than the game. It was. We're watching a lot of bad football this season. It feels yes, it does feel. But then you look at the ratings, and it's like forty million people watch the it's a, crazy, watch the right? Texans. It's like, yeah, it's a, you would think that there would start to be a disconnect. People would start getting There's frustrated not. and stop watching it. But you know what? Mo ne what next Monday night is what Ravens versus. Uh, Cleveland Raven. Browns, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Who and you cares? Know, people will still watch it. They'll yeah. just watch it. It's like airplane food. They'll eat it. They don't care. You have no uh, no other option. Like, what else am I going to watch? <laughs> now, uh, when you were a kid, did you want to be a writer? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm i a Boston kid. I grew up in a suburb of Boston called Belmont, Massachusetts, and I was a paper boy for the Boston Globe. And, you know, this was when, you know, Will McDonough was the football columnist. Bob Ryan was the basketball columnist. They had great writers, Bud Collins. Uh, Leslie Visser, and you know, you read that section, and it just made you want to be uh, a sports writer in the same way like a cool record made everybody want to be in a band. It just that was the thing, and they just seemed to have awesome lives, and and um, uh, you know that. So that was something I aspired to. Funny thing though, my dad was a pretty serious guy. He was a science teacher. Um, you know, thought of sports, you know, even though he was a coach of a tennis team, he, he thought of sports as somewhat being like a frivolous thing. Yeah. He used to take the sports section out of the newspaper and put it on top of the fridge where I couldn't get it until I read the other stuff in the newspaper. So, like, this is a lesson for all parents out there. And the classic example of your parents denying you the thing that you will eventually do, you know, right. whether it's booze or weed or sports sections, you know, I ended up being the thing that my dad was trying to guard against. And what sort of steps did you take as a kid? Were you a journal kid where you kept a diary, that sort of thing, or no? Not really. I mean, I was a pretty mediocre student all around. I could write a sentence, all right? You know, I, I enjoyed reading. I think that's what it was. It's just you, you read like crazy, and then you imitate the stuff that you like, and it starts to come a little naturally to you, hopefully. Um, 
And and I just again, you know, I read so many sports stories. I read so many columns. I read so many sports books. Man, I read the Pete Rose story, the Sandy Koufax story, the Joe Namath story. Every bio imaginable about sports. It, you know, it started to pick up, and and uh, you know, I started doing a little bit of writing for the local newspaper about the junior high school basketball team and stuff like that. And then then you uh, get to go to college, and and that's where you can major in uh, journalism. Do you yeah. do that? Which I did not do. You did I'm not. Embarrassed. Why? I, I don't know. I went to the University of Wisconsin, and you know, if you've been to one of these uh, party schools like the University of Wisconsin, you know, school starts to become a little bit of an afterthought. But what um, was your major then? My major was political science. Thank you for thinking I had a major because it, that's nice. It's, I forget it sometimes. Um, uh, but it wasn't until after school I started. I got a real job at a real newspaper. And then uh, from and you start writing columns, or you just start you covering oh boy, sports? No, not for a while. So my first job at a newspaper, I sold advertising. You know, I was on oh, the that's business the worst. side. Uh, it was, and, and I was terrible at it. Yeah, I, I mean, did that in the radio. It was terrible. But you know what? What do you think? Because I think in some respects it's good because. First of all, a lot of people on the editorial side, they have no idea what the business no idea. people are. They have disrespect for it. And I think it's good to kind of know what drives the bus. What's the yes. engine of a media company? And it's people out on the street being salespeople. Uh, granted, I wasn't bringing much business in, but like it just taught me about that connection. And there's no pressure. I don't care. It, even today, no, there's no pressure I've had as a writer that's comparable to that relationship stuff that you have to do in sales. And you have to like... You have to nourish and you have to uh, 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 cultivate that relationship in a way that no sort. I mean, it's it's incredible uh, how how much work it actually was, and I was bad at it. And the true story is, this newspaper, the editor was like, "Well, you know, you're not really working out as a sales guy. Uh, I'm not going to can you, but how's about covering the little league?" And that was my first assignment at a newspaper was covering travel Little League baseball. And how old are you at this point? Uh, 22. Does, yeah. Do you feel too old to be doing that, covering Little League? You or feel no? a little weird, <laughs> right? You feel a little weird going up to like 11-year-olds for post games, right? You know, what hey, were you Billy, thinking? You know, situations there in the fifth <laughs> inning. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it is weird. And, of course, the other part of it is the parents are nutters, yeah. you know, and you got to make sure that all the kids' names are spelled right. And you, and you can't – it's not like you're writing, like, you know, why did they make the pitching change in the fourth? Why did he go to the bullpen? I mean, you have to the, – the, 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 there's a skill set to writing about youth sports, which I think is important, which is sort of treat the game humanely. Yeah. And then how long do you do that before you can move on to something else? I did that for about – Four years. Four uh, years? Yeah. You covered well, I league? got a full, not all Little League. No, thankfully, I migrated from Little League to high school. I did a lot of high school sports. Um, I got a real sort of ABC's education in political writing, uh, you know, municipal writing, transportation, police, cops and robbers, all that stuff. Uh, and then uh, my next job, I went to Boston to work at the Boston Phoenix, which was, you know, kind of like the Village Voice, you know, alternative newspaper. It's not around anymore, but this was a place where you could kind of start writing longer articles. You know, I started to inject a little bit of opinion, uh, and that was a great place for me to work. Um, you know, it was right next door to Fenway Park. You know, I have to walk through that crazy mob every night on the way home from work. Uh, but, you know, I, I needed that education, too, so that was a great place to work. Uh, and then w did you, when in your writing then, were you starting to be funny in your writing or were they sort of straight articles still at that you know, point? That, that, by then you start, you know, this was alternative newspapering. So they want a little bit of attitude in there, you know, whether it was, you know, people demanding social justice or people trying to be funny or people trying to be extremely critical. Um, yeah, I, I think I sort of migrated towards funny stuff. That was the kind of writing that I liked. Um, and you know, but it wasn't always in evidence. You know, we were writing about like drug crime and stuff like that. So I wasn't writing jokes about the methamphetamine problem in New England and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. some, you know, you pick your spots. But I remember, you know, this was, you know, uh, you know, I've been out of Boston for a long time. And so, so Boston's like reign as this like insanely obnoxious, you know, championship town is totally foreign to me. We were lovable losers then. The Patriots were terrible. The Red Sox always broke your heart. Um, you know, the Celtics were somewhat passable, but the rest of it was a disaster. So, you know, the sports writing that I did then was basically about how messed up things were, and, it, and you had to have a sense of humor about it. And did you have visions when you were at the Boston Phoenix that I, I can move on to uh, bigger newspapers? 
the more mainstream stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny because now that pyramid or ladder or whatever way you want to describe it is, is has evaporated somewhat. There are fewer newspapers. There are fewer small newspapers, especially. And so, you know, when you talk to a younger person about like how you got from, a, a, you know, A to B, you know, the, some of the steps are gone. But I had pretty much the really traditional, uh, you know, uh, ladder, which was, you know, a smaller paper to a slightly bigger paper to a slightly bigger paper. And eventually to New York, um, which is something I really wanted to do since when I was very young uh, to come to the city. And, and, and I got my first job there at the New York Observer, which was a weekly newspaper. You know, and it, it, same situation, you know, a smaller paper there and then migrating to other things after that. And, and what could you be making for a living like at the Observer and living in New York? It has to, you, you're not killing it, right? I had a very small apartment. My yeah. first apartment in New York was very small. And I remember vividly, it was in Brooklyn. And the <laughs> the real estate agent calls the owner, the landlord of the apartment, and says, "We got this kid here. He he he's got a you know he's got his first paycheck. He's got, you know he says he wants his apartment." And you could hear the landlord over the phone saying, "Can't you find a banker or somebody <laughs> more responsible than a journalist?" <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So you know, but I miss that. I I really do. I'm not to say that like I'm like rolling in hundreds right now, but I, I you know the, there's part of that scrap. I'm sure you feel the same way. There's parts of like that sort of you don't know what's happening two days from now that I, that are exciting and and I miss. And you also I I felt like with radio like I I started down in Tampa, yeah, making hardly any money, but the cost of living being what it is down there, like I don't feel like my lifestyle's changed at all. Isn't that the funny thing? Yeah, because yeah. as you make more money. It's more to park here. It's yeah. more to, to do everything you want to do in everything. New York. Yeah. Just costs way more than it did in Tampa. So it's like kind of absolutely. Out. And I even feel I even feel in the time that I've been living in New York, New York has become much more expensive. That's yeah. the thing that's hilarious is that in addition to the fact that you move to this place where it's going to cost exorbitantly more than any other place in the country, except maybe like what the Bay Area. It's gotten crazier within the context of New York. Like New York in 2015 is a lot nuttier than it was 15 years ago, for sure. The only place I see more expensive when I watch House Hunters, anyone in like DC, if you're near the train, yeah, then that's a then yeah. that seems like crazy for a really small place. If you could walk to the metro, I think they call it there, right? Those shows make me banana. My wife is obsessed with them. Yeah, I love we're, that one. We're renovating right now, and you watch. You know, I know what things cost now in New York. It's insane. Uh, and and you watch uh, uh, those renovation shows yeah. especially, and they say, oh, well, you know, you only got a budget of $28,000, but we're going to build you a farmhouse and a five-car <laughs> garage. And you're like, what? And a basketball court. How do you feel about that? We can get it all done for about, I don't know, eighteen grand. Yeah, or you, when you first, if you turn it on in the middle of an episode and you don't know where they are, and they'll say, well, we have a budget of one hundred and eighty grand. We need five bedrooms. And yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, here's like nine places to choose from. Like, where is this? <laughs> what town yeah. is this in? Yeah. But that no one's making any money out there, I guess. That's true. I guess so. So then uh, where's your, what's your, uh, after the Observer in New York, where do you get to Then go? I went into magazines. I got a job at GQ. Um, was that was, like a full-time job? Yeah, it was a full-time job. I joined as a, 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 a senior editor, and I was writing for them and doing a little bit of editing, and that was awesome. I mean, that was the most dramatic job change for me. Because, the salary changes, yeah, too? Yeah, you get a little bit more money, and the life is, you know, it's plusher. You're only writing, you know, it's 12 months a year is the issue, so if you're writing in seven or eight of those, that's pretty good. So your productivity uh, theoretically goes down. Do you um, go into an office every yeah, day? Yeah, there's an You go office. to GQ every day. I went into GQ. I and had to you upgrade do? my wardrobe dramatically. Yeah, I, I went. I mean, you know, I've downgraded since. But, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of pressure. It's the Connie Nast building. It's where Vogue is. It's where all these other New Yorker, all these other fancy magazines. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I have to worry about ties and stuff. But, but yeah, I went into the office every day. But, and what do you do? You go, you go in there. You What do you do? Well... You have to start coming up with ideas of We articles. have ideas, you know, so I'm do, sort of simultaneously trying to do two things. I'm working on stories that I'm writing, so I'm reporting, and, and then I'm doing a little bit of traveling, you know, during the month. And then I'm assigning stories and editing them. I was editing sort of the cultural section of the magazine, so I, I was, you know, assigning people to write about records and books and movies and do some interviews and stuff like that. So I had sort of dual responsibilities. But so when I wasn't on the road, I was in the office. And uh, what sort of things there did you do that were like 
th- the the big things for you? You know, I did a lot of celebrity stuff. I did some cover stories. So you, you know, follow these celebrities around? Yeah. So, you know, you get assigned to do a, a, a celebrity story and you spend time with them. And, you know, I've done some sports stories. I remember I did a story about David Ortiz uh, pretty soon after 2004 that I was excited about. Went down to the Dominican Republic with him. Um, and you know, it's different, you know, it's a different beast. You know, now I work in daily newspapering and you know, as well as I do, you know, when you're in the locker room and when you're spending time on a day to day, um, in that environment, you know, the, the access is sometimes short and guys are clipped and they're not really excited to sit with 15, you know, tape recorders out in front of their mouths. And then you go work at a place like GQ and David or David Ortiz is like, come on down, have lunch at my place. Let me show you my cars. Here's my samurai sword collection. I remember he had a big picture of him above his fireplace. He had a fireplace in the Dominican Republic uh, with, uh, with uh, Ellen DeGeneres, you know, there's David and Ellen DeGeneres. Um, but you know, so it's a it's a different it's a different uh, situation because they're sort of excited to be in these magazines. And how long would you spend with a guy like David Ortiz? I think a couple days, which you know was That's pretty solid time. for a, for a magazine story. You and know, do you, do you walk around with a tape recorder? Yeah, well, you know, you you tape him. Um, you know, there are photographers there to take a picture and so on. So it's a full like multi. Uh, modal experience. But is it, is it, does it get formal? Like you sit down, you, you talk like you and I are talking or as you're walking okay. around the house, he says things and do you assume everything he says is usable? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, unless someone says, in my opinion, unless someone specifically says, you know, I'd like to go off the record here, which I will honor, um, then everything else is considered to be on the record. Now I don't walk in the door, shake someone's hand and jam a microphone <laughs> into their mouth. That'd just be socially rude. But Typically, the way these things work, and, and, and I'm sorry if I'm alienating the audience with this sort of banal magazine description, but they, they, they there's sort of a standard format to celebrity quote unquote profiling. They do what's called the interview and the activity. And so it's sort of a two prong thing. So, for example, if you're going, spending time with an actress, you know, you will do an interview, which typically will maybe be at their home if you're lucky or you know, a restaurant somewhere, and then you'll do an activity. And that can sometimes be somewhat forced. It's like, let's go to the batting cages, or we'll play pitch and putt, or we'll go, I don't know, walk down Fifth Avenue. The best one I ever did like that with the activity was uh, Johnny Knoxville. This was like at like the peak of Jackass Mania when he was really, you know, it's funny to think about now, but he was a very famous guy. Uh, and he, his activity, what he wanted to do was get a six-pack and go sit on the corner of Broadway and just drink the six-pack on the cor- curbstone and just sitting there. And he looks at, you know, he's dressed as Johnny Knoxville, so, like, he's drawing a crowd. And people are double-taking, walking past. That's, you know, that's sort of the ideal. You don't have to really overthink these things. So that's sort of the ideal activity for one of those things. The holidays are here, and you really should be looking your best. You don't want to show up to your in-laws or your family's house looking all scraggly for Christmas or Hanukkah celebrations, and you definitely don't want to go to your work party in front of your boss looking like you haven't shaved in three days. May I suggest Harry's? Harry's is all about quality. You get German-engineered five-blade cartridges. That gives you a real close shave with no cuts, no burns. Harry's quality blades are guaranteed. You get yourself a full refund if you're not happy. Now, how does Harry's keep these prices down low? Factory direct prices, that's how. They cut out the middleman. There's no store. They're able to sell their blades at half the price of some of the more popular brands that you've heard of. Over one million guys have already made the switch, and thousands more switch every single day. Harry's doesn't like the discount because their prices are already really low. But I have a special offer for my listeners. Harry's will give you $5 off your first order with my exclusive code, BORING. So go to harrys.com and enter code BORING. It is gift-giving season, and Harry's got you covered. The limited edition holiday set includes a copper razor, three blades, a bottle of foaming shave gel, and their new travel bag. Oh, and you can also get the razor engraved as a gift. harrys.com It's Al's Boring Podcast with Al Dukes. 
And then how does your run come to an end there at GQ? Is that something you decide I've kind of been here and done this a while? Or do they say, uh, yeah, I went to, well, I, I, I got a job offer to go to Rolling Stone and, and I was very excited about that. Rolling Stone was, I think the first magazine I ever had a subscription to when I was younger and I was super psyched to go do that. And, uh, so yeah, it wasn't the slightest bit acrimonious or anything like that. I went over to Rolling Stone, um, to do what specifically there, same kind of thing. You know, a little bit of combination, some editing, uh, and some, um, uh, you know, writing and profiling and cover stories and stuff like that. And who'd you get, uh, who'd you do uh, cover stories on? I think the biggest one for sure that I was the most excited about was Letterman. Um, really? Which uh, era was that? Like what? This what? was, uh, this was late at the end of last decade. So I think it was 2008. There was a big comedy issue. The cover was Letterman, Tina Fey, and Chris Rock. And I did, you know, the quote unquote Rolling Stone interview with David Letterman. And, you know, he doesn't do many interviews. It's not a big thing for him to talk. I saw you tweeted out today that he he, he, he talked struck, to Maxim. Yeah, it's so bizarre to me. Right. Well, Why Maxim, Maxim actually is a, is a part sponsor of his indie racing car team. So okay. I think he has a relationship with the magazine there. But it was a really good story. It was about cars. It wasn't like Dave talking about his life and times. But, you know, he's a, the funny thing about him is that for a guy who doesn't do this and puts on all this like, oh, I'm, I'm not that interesting. You're going to learn, you know, why I don't do this very often. He's a great interview. I mean, he has a lot to say. He has real opinions. And I think it comes from this place, Al, that like if you have a show and your show is inviting people on and you know what you need out of them, which is for them to be compelling guests, for them to have something to say, just something, you know, just bring something to the table that's going to entertain my audience for four and a half minutes. I think he feels like if I'm going to do it, if I'm going to actually commit to doing an interview, I'm going to work like hell to be interesting. I'm going to be a good guest. I'm going to answer the questions truthfully and not obfuscate and not just be some BS artist and really tell you what I think about stuff. And so what I was very, I mean, I was nervous as hell as doing this because I grew up with the show. I worshipped him. You know, how old a guy are you? May I ask? Me, I'm 45. Okay, so I came out of you know. Yeah, I'm 46. I, Letterman was like the guy in the 80s. And you remember, and, 90s, and you yeah. remember that. First of all, no one DVR'd. I mean, there was no DVR. There were barely VCR. people didn't even know how to VCR basically. And the idea of you know 12:30, I stayed up. I stayed up to watch the NBC show. You know, that's what you did. And I had my idiot friends in school who we all worshipped him and that was a thing. And so for me, you know, he's about as big of an oracle as there is in in, in comedy. Uh and so I was really nervous about it, but then, you know, he ends up being as great as a conversationalist as you possibly can ask for. And, I, you know, you just give a question and he'll just go. As a fan, did didn't didn't the CBS show feel weird? Like it was like super produced, and it was everything the NBC show wasn't, which was no one's you know on NBC it was no one's watching. If this comedy bit doesn't work, who cares? <laughs> where when it got yeah. to uh, CBS, it felt like yeah. a Broadway thing where everything was super produced. And I think that's entirely fair. I mean, I, and and I think they would totally cop to that because. There's a different kind of pressure. It's a 11:30 show. It was a much more commercial enterprise. CBS was paying big dollars for it. They were going up against the Tonight Show. They had to appeal to as many people as possible. I mean, they that that was very clear. Uh, as those last you know few months started happening recently, when Letterman was retiring. I think a lot of people started to circulate clips from those old NBC shows, and you watch them, especially stuff like Chris Elliott and, you know, um, the dog tricks and the monkey cam. And, like, they're so crazy and out there. And they're not just crazy and out there in the context of Letterman. Like, they're crazy, period, for anybody. No one does what he does. I mean, his influence is so far and wide. But in terms of just being uniquely him and strange and almost like hostile to like the format. It's incredible. I mean, there was a show that I was watching not that long ago where he had, um, oh, it was Chris Elliott doing the Morton Downey Jr. Oh, spoof. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yeah, he did where the Chris Elliott the, Jr. The pimples on his uh, face and <laughs> scream. So you at people. think about that. You think about like in 2015, you know, if you have a show and you say, like, okay, well, we're going to have a guy on the show. He's an associate producer. You know, he, we think he's funny. He's going to come on. He's going to do a 15 minute bit <laughs> about a reasonably obscure syndicated New Jersey talk show. And we're just going to do it. And right. there's always, sounds great. Let's do it. Right. You know, and that's just what the show was. What was the, uh, 
most surreal part for you when you got to hang with Letterman for those for that time? How long does it take you to get comfortable with a guy like that? Oh, never. I never. Mean, <laughs> not, yeah, never. You never completely. I mean, I think like just seeing him face to face was, you know, weird. A right? Pretty big thing. Yeah, because first of all, he uh, is wearing like you know like a Patagonia like you know fleece pullover and I think cargo <laughs> shorts and sneakers and he's just rambling down like I met him at his like I think it's like his lawyer's office or some sort of rando office building in the city and uh, uh, you know he'd just come from the show I think they taped around like 5 30 and he was like I was like how was the show he's like oh it's going right over to the radio and TV museum <laughs> they're sending trucks it's going to the Hall of Fame one of the classics of all time um, you know, so so self-deprecating. Um, but the thing, one thing that I remember about uh, that, and it was a cool thing, was that you know Harry, his kid, uh, was still quite young. I think he was about four, four or five years old. That uh, no, younger, like three or four. And I have a niece the same age. I mean, I have my own children now, but I have a niece. I had a niece around that age then. And I had bought her one of those like bikes, you know, these bikes that I don't have pedals anymore. They sort of, pe- you sort of, they don't have the training wheels rather. And you just sort of. Is it like ride. an elliptical? No, it's, it's, it's like a paddle bike. You paddle with your feet. You go oh, up okay. and you see the kids sort of like using it. And, and, and what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to teach you balance much better than training wheels do. And, you know, kids learn how to ride a bike when they're like two and a half, three years old. It's crazy. Anyway, long story short. I don't know how the hell it came up, but I, you know, I was into bikes and all this stuff and I started talking to him about it. And then maybe a few weeks later, I got a note from him saying, Hey, I got Harry the like bike and like, we really like it. You know, that was just what he, you know, got in touch about that. He, uh, he had purchased the like bike. So, you know, that was my influence on David Letterman. He bought a like bike. And what do you do if you, you have to spend three or four days with somebody and, and you know, sometimes people just don't go with people. Like they're just not feeling it at all. And they're they're just not, not feeling that. Yeah, you could tell they're just not feeling it. And it's not the initial not feeling it. Like it's just not happening. Well, I mean, there's a story in Little Victories about uh, Rihanna. Right. Uh, I wrote a cover story for Vogue maybe <laughs> three and a half years ago about Rihanna. And to level with you, she's great. I mean, I had gone to dinner with her and had this interview with her, and she's kind of like, you know, if you like her or don't like her, one thing you have to agree about Rihanna is she lets it all hang out. She's she is who she is. She doesn't apologize, and that's great. As a reporter, that's the kind of person you want. You let someone just ask anything you want. I mean, she'll talk to you about anything, truly. Uh, <laughs> but I was supposed to do this follow-up interview with her, and uh, they're like, okay, well, you're going to go to the Video Music Awards, the MTV Music Awards, and... Um, you can do the interview afterwards, and Rihanna will fly you back on her private jet to uh, New York. And you do the interview on the plane. And I'm like, dude, this is going to be amazing. I mean, can you imagine? This is going to be the best plane ride ever. You know, I'm used to being stuck in, like, 38F on the back of, like, you know, uh, Spirit. And uh, I was like, this is going to be the best trip ever. And as it turns out... uh, you know, she doesn't want to do the interview after the VMA. She's tired. We go to the plane, and it is a private plane. Uh, and and for me, first time on something like this, and there's a bed in the front, and uh, and and she gets into this bed. You know, there's one bed on the plane. And, you know, it's fair enough. It goes, it goes to Rihanna. So there are maybe six or seven other people on the plane, some assistants and so on. And they're like, well, she, she'll do the interview, uh, you know, before we take off. And instead, she doesn't do the interview, and then she falls asleep. And not only that, I'm not going to get dropped off in New York now. I'm going to be dropped off in um, North Dakota. Or no, uh, yeah, Minot, North Dakota. Or Minot, South Dakota. Forgive me, residents of the Dakotas, for not remembering. I think believe it's South Dakota. Um, but it's a uh, that's a much different stop than New York City is in, because they want to refuel, and then they're going to London. They're dropping me on the tarmac. Rihanna's asleep the whole time. And and I'm just sitting there like, what do I do to like wake her up? Do yeah, I like, can't go, wake up Brianna? Yeah, what do I just randomly go and like grab her? <laughs> and <laughs> I go to her assistant. I wake up her assistant, and I'm like, you got to wake her up for me. Like, what am I going to possibly do? And you do this like thing, and it goes back and forth. And finally, with you know, you start to feel the plane descend. And I'm like, I'm not going to get the interview. And I'm totally host. And they wake her up. 
And you do this like completely unnatural thing, which is you interview somebody about their personal life. And I'm asking her questions about like Chris Brown in front of like eight people on an airplane. I mean, this is totally not a natural situation and it's very uncomfortable. It's I'm sure it's uncomfortable for her, but you know, you'd learn to roll with it. And I think if you're honest about it and you kind of tell what actually that moment was like, and in the book, what I say is that like, what sounds like kind of a cool thing, uh, which is like going on a plane What Rihanna was one of the most pathetic, desperate moments of my life where I was like sweaty and gross and like completely reeking of anxiety the entire time. Um, you know, if you're honest about that, I think the audience will go with you. And then uh, how does that end at Rolling Stone magazine? They tell you to get out or you got I got out? laid off. You did. I got laid off. Surprised or you kind of saw it coming? Shock. <laughs> Shocked. I was shocked. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is the, 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 the fall, the autumn of 2008. And, um, you know, as many people remember, you know, it was rough times. This is when the Bear Stearns collapse happened. You know, the economy was completely going nuts. Um, you know, Lehman, everything, all that stuff. Uh, it was tough times, and a lot of people were losing their jobs. And a lot of people at Rolling Stone were losing their jobs before me. I was under the impression that I was safe, but that's the way it works. And then you come into an office. I was the new guy around. I'd been there for like eight months. I'd done the Letterman interview like four weeks before that. You know, I thought it was okay. Yeah, you were safe. I thought it was safe. And then, you know, that's how it works. You're not safe. And then you're gone. And, you know, as anyone who's gone through that kind of thing, and it's a pretty steady thing that happens in our business and the media business, you know, it's a tough pill. And, you know, you feel embarrassed. You feel a degree of professional humiliation. You feel everyone knows. Um, But I got some good advice. And I write about this in the book. I got a good advice. I, I was seeing a therapist at the time. And, and, and thankfully I was seeing a therapist at the time and he was a sort of, he didn't really talk much, but he said, I went into him and I, and I said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm totally freaked out about this. You know, I got laid off. It's just before Christmas. I don't know what I'm going to do. The economy's down the tubes. I don't know if I'm going to get another job. They wrote about this in the New York post, you know, like my, my layoff is in the New York post. What am I going to do? And he looks at me and he goes, you know what? I, I hate to tell you this, but you know what? Nobody gives a bleep. You know, no one gives a bleep. You know, nobody. And it sort of caught me in my tracks because he's basically saying no one cares about me. Right. But he's absolutely true. The world just completely pushes on. And, you know, if anything, accelerates away from you if you're not willing to jump right back in that. And that was really good advice for me because it just underlined the fact that I couldn't sort of wallow in this, that I couldn't just think that I was exceptional or I'd been wronged, even though I might still feel wronged. Um I just had to get back at it, and I got really lucky. I got my job back at GQ and started writing for them again, and they really, really hooked me up with that. And, and, and you know, it led to a lot of awesome things happening. And, you you know, if you've ever lost a job, the thing you get sick of really quickly is people saying to you, you know what, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. You, you wait know a what? couple months down the yeah, line. Yeah, you just wait. You know, I hate it. I was like, it doesn't feel like that right now <laughs> at all. It feels pretty crappy. Um, but lo and behold, you know, and it didn't take too long to realize that it really did become the best thing that ever happened to me because it opened up a whole new world of opportunities that I never would have had, had I, you know, stuck on there. And, and I, and I don't want to say I'm grateful for it. I don't want to go through it again. I would never wish it upon anybody to have to go through that experience because it's painful, but yes, it definitely proved to be in the long term. Any in the, even in the short term, uh, a, a, a great, great uh, moment. Can a writer make a living not working directly for a GQ or Rolling Stone, but somebody who writes articles for various publications? As a freelancer? Yeah, like a freelancer. Sure. Person. I mean, listen, I think it's quite hard. I think that two things have happened that are uh, hugely significant. One is that there are fewer publications now than there were. Um, in terms of print publications, um, they have been replaced by online publications of which have created a lot more opportunities, but pay less. So you're, you know, you're working just as hard, but you're probably making less for the work that you're doing. Um, I think, you know, in my experience of doing it, which I did for a little while, uh, you know, it's a hustle, man. You know, it's like anything else. It's like you get a little bit here, you get a little bit there. You can't sit back and say like, well, I'm just going to like, write a big story for, you know, this magazine, or I'm going to be a contract writer for New Yorker, and that's what's going to happen to me. You have to, like, do it all. You know, you're writing for trade magazines, you're writing for big magazines, hopefully, you're writing for newspapers, you're writing for 
airplane, everything, everything you can possibly do. You do not say no, or at least I didn't say no. I said yes to, yes to basically everything because you don't know where it's coming from next and no one's promised you anything. So it is possible. And I definitely don't want to disrespect people who, you know, have struggled at it. And, 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 and I, in fairness, you know, it's been a while for me since I've been in that marketplace and I'm sure things are a little bit different, but I, you know, I, I do know a good number of people who are successful at it and I would never want to discourage somebody from trying to do that because I think that people can find that really liberating. Yeah, there used to be a thing years ago called the writer's market. It was like this. this I remember book, that, right? Thing. And you yeah. could, it would tell you what type of articles each right. magazine was interested totally. in and yep. what they would yeah. pay you. Yes, the writer's market. And it was like this big, like, dictionary thick thing, and you'd go through it. And I remember, like, I mean, I, I'll level with you. When I was a kid growing up in Massachusetts, I'd go to a magazine stand and I'd look at, like, GQ or Rolling Stone or something, Sports Illustrated, and be like, how does anyone get a job working at that point? I mean, to me, they were like Oz. I could not fathom how somebody could get a job like that and yeah the writer's market you'd go through it and you'd see these like you know they'd be the names of the editor of you know these places yeah. and this is the kind of story they like and this is what they don't like ah, i love that thing do they even publish it i'm sure I, they publish it it's I online. Just, I, it is online it's yeah. an online thing but you pay yeah. a subscription to do it online a writer is one of those jobs i think that people think that they want to do or that they can do yeah and then you actually have to write something Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think that's true. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, some people get tired of that experience of it. But for me, honestly, I can't do anything else, Al. Like, I have no other life skills. Like, right. if I couldn't figure out a way to make this work, I'd be completely hosed. So I have to, like, figure it out. And I still enjoy it. I, you know, maybe it's weird, but, like, I still like you know, here's the story and you got to get it done by a certain, you know, like a little bit of pressure of the deadline. I like, you know, the reader feedback, all that stuff. I, I'm just into it. I, maybe there's something weird about it, but I just, I just really like it. And you're at the wall street journal now. How yeah. many columns are you doing a week? Right now it's uh, somewhere between two and four, you know, news dependent, of course, if like big things start to happen or, you know, on the, on the clock for more action. But, um, yeah, no, this job started uh, about six years ago, and, you know, again, to be candid, I wasn't a big Wall Street Journal reader. You know, I had tremendous respect for it. I yeah. knew it was this great newspaper, but I wasn't, like, reading it every day. Did you even I, know they had a sports section? Well, they didn't. They, oh, they didn't. <laughs> they, had a, they, they had, you know, people who wrote about sports, and they had some amazing sports writing over the years. They remember they like, broke, like, the Reggie Lewis story about the medical team and all that stuff. Um but they didn't have a dedicated sports page until about six, seven years ago. And they were looking for somebody to write a Monday column. And they asked me to try out for it. And it was this funny thing where, like, I do, like, a fake column. Like, I watch, like, a, you know, a couple games and I write this thing about, you know, what happened. And, and it doesn't get published anymore, but they're just like, okay, you know, this guy can, you know, put a noun in front of the verb and so on, you know. Uh, and they judge you on that. And then they let me write it for real in the real paper. So that's how it began. So what's your process now? If you think of something while you're walking down the street to go get a coffee and you think of an angle, what do you do? You, you write it into your phone? Do you, do you just think, I'll remember this when I get home? Well, you... First of all, that's the best thing ever. That's the best feeling ever when you actually have an idea like that seizes you and yeah. you like, can't get wait to get back and write it. It's much harder to like open your you know, keyboard at a Go. game or something like that. Be like, what am I going to say about <laughs> this nonsense? That's the worst. When you actually feel compelled to like write that, 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 that's the best kind of feeling. Cause you get it done quicker too. I oh. find, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I, I wish I was the kind of person who kind of had a list, you know, I sometimes keep lists like we'll do this. And then this time of year we'll do this. Uh, but you know, I find, especially in New York, because we see, you know, there's so much competition and there's so much other media, you know, there's obviously big radio here, there's television, you know, even the big national outlets are all sort of headquartered here. Um, you really have to do something that I find, you know, is a little bit different and you have to distinguish yourself, you know, by, you know, a certain style or a certain, ad, you know, um, approach. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you sort of, the journal, again, you know, we're not, we're a young section, uh, we're not people, we don't look at ourselves as people's first read. You're not like going to the journal to find out exactly a you know, box score of the Knicks game. But you're kind of like taking everything and, and, and turning it maybe, you know, 30 degrees and uh, you're finding interesting angles, maybe some uh, opinions that are a little bit 
uh, different than what you're ordinarily seeing? Because uh, if you're not, if you're just trying to repeat everything everybody else does, you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna stand out at all, and and we wouldn't have lasted. So we're a little bit off the beaten trail there, but I think that's what readers like about it. The holidays are here, and socks and underwear used to be a boring stocking stuffer, but Mack Weldon has changed it into a top-of-the-line gift. We're talking underwear, socks, and T-shirts. The Mack Weldon holiday packs are not just the gift that every man needs, it's the gift that every man is excited to get. Mack Weldon believes in smart design, premium fabrics, and simple shopping. Seriously, go to MacWeldon.com right now. Look how easy it is to shop there. If you want underwear, you simply click on the underwear link. Want socks? Oh, I don't know. Maybe click on the socks link. It's so simple. So many websites are so convoluted these days. All of the products at Mac Weldon eliminate odor naturally. They want you to be comfortable. So if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it. They'll still refund you the money. No questions asked. They don't want your used underwear back, but you're not going to want to send it back because it's going to go in the drawer and it's going to be your favorite pair of underwear. Trust me, when I go see my girlfriend on the weekends, I make sure to pack my Mack Weldon underwear. I call it my good underwear. Mack Weldon's underwear socks and shirts look great and they perform great. You can wear them working out. You can wear them going to work. You can wear them going out on hot dates. Just everyday life. Go to MacWeldon.com, get 20% off using promo code BORING. It's that simple. MacWeldon.com, promo code BORING, 20% off. It's Al's Boring Podcast. And uh, for your book, Little Victories, did you decide, hey, I want to write this book, let me find someone who will publish it, or did someone come to you and say, hey, we have an idea for a book, or we like your writing, did you have ideas it's for like a book? It's like somewhere in between that. I had had, a, you know, so when I started writing the column, um, uh, you know, over a period of years, uh, uh, occasionally I would have conversations with folks about, okay, well, maybe we should do a book, and, you know, should it be some sort of compilation of journal story or something? And I knew I didn't want to do that. You didn't want to do a compilation. That sounds a lot easier. It is a lot easier. <laughs> you just grab them and slam them together. But, uh, can I be totally candid with you? Yeah. I, I, I just... No one reads those. I don't, you know, like, I mean, am I really going to go back and read, like, my dumb Mets column from no. nine years ago? Like, who no. wants to read that, okay? And I don't think they sell that well. So I, from a strictly commercial standpoint, I just felt I had to do new stuff. That way, people who read you and like your stuff, they're like, oh, well, you didn't, I didn't read this before, so I'll get it. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something totally different, but I didn't want to be so far afield from the stuff that I did in the journal that it would be unrecognizable. I wasn't like looking to like do a dramatic turn or write a novel or something like that. So what Little Victories is, it's a, it's effectively, it's a advice book for people who can't stand advice books. It's rules for people who can't follow rules. And if you're like me and you go through a bookstore, or if you don't go to the bookstore, you go through the airport and you see that you know, row of shiny books that are promising you like, you know, a six pack in like, you know, eight days or, you know, a 13 second work week or the most uncluttered home in the history of homes. Uh, I just can't relate to those books. You know, I aspire to those kinds of things. I would love to have an organized house or a six pack or, you know, a 13 second work week. But I just, I know myself, I, I, I'm very good at uh, underachievement. And so what I wanted to do was write an advice book for the rest of us. And so I came up with this concept of little victories, you know, small mundane life achievements that we can all recognize that we all see in our lives that, you know, they might not be like climbing Mount Everest. They might not like be buying your first home or getting a master's degree or something like that. But look, look, you know, if you get through Starbucks without like strangling somebody, you know, that's also a little victory. These are things that we can celebrate. So, you know, really plainly speaking, this book, I want people to laugh. I want, there's a little bit of stuff about my family and some setbacks that have happened along the way of my life and my family's life um, that I think add a little bit of hopefully a little richness to it. Um, but really, I just yeah, I want it to be a light, fun book that you can you can buy for other people. I took some notes while I was reading your book. All right, great. Not many of them. I took some notes. <laughs> so these are things that stood out to me. The fact that you referenced the Lemonheads, the outdoor type, which is one of my favorite songs. Is it really? And I thought awesome. no one would. That was one, That's one of those songs where I feel like a new band could go out and do that, have a hit with it, and no one would even know it existed prior to that. That's so funny. You know, I, you, know you might be right. You know, it's a catchy song. And catchy it's really song. cleverly written. Right. Um, I 
the story behind it is that that's the song. When I got married, I sang that song at the wedding to my wife. That was my speech. Instead of giving a groom speech, I, I wimped out of that and I just sang that song. A friend of mine played guitar and the song is about somebody, you know, I, my wife is an outdoorsy person. She's hiked the Appalachian Trail. I don't want to go outside on Sundays. Yeah, I want to watch like nine hours of football. <laughs> so we're different. And so that song is about that kind of contrast. And you write about uh, riding a bike to clear your head. Yeah. That yeah. still works for you? Oh, totally. Uh, you know, again, I have to credit my wife. When I met her, she rode a bike in New York City. And I thought, Which is that crazy. is about the craziest thing you can do. I was like, that's more dangerous than being a heroin addict, riding a bike in New York City. And I was like, you're nuts. You should not do that. And of course, as love goes, I couldn't get her to get off the bike. I had to get a bike. Got and a so bike. I got a bike. And I started riding around the city. And boy, is it an adrenaline rush. And I think it has gotten safer in the time that we've been together. Uh, but I went, you know, I was like, I'm never going to wear spandex. That's lame. And of course, then I'm wearing spandex. I'm like, I'm not going to ride 100 miles into Jersey. And then I'm riding 100 miles into Jersey. I'm doing all the things I said I'd never do. But it just did something for me. You know, as anyone, you know, who's had, you know, stresses and moments of, I don't know if you'd call it depression, but the blues and just sort of things that, you know, get you down. It just works for me. And for other people, it's like going to the gym or it's like listening to music or it's other activities. It just works like 100% of the time for me just getting on a bike and pedaling and just forgetting about things momentarily. It just does something for me that no, it's like the perfect drug. You also talk about the importance of travel. Yeah. See, that to me seems like a pain in the ass. Like <laughs> the, just the flights and the... Everything takes forever to get to the airport, the flight delays, but that's an important... You, so if you think if you have money, because yeah. a lot of people say, oh, I would love to travel, I don't yeah. have the money. Y yeah. You should find the money to travel. Well, I also say in there, though, in fairness, and I'm with you on the pain in the neck thing, because I've been traveling a lot recently to talk about this book, and I've had a l lot of time in the American airport system, and boy, we have some work to do. Um, but... I don't like the sort of guilt trip aspect of travel. People say, oh, you got to travel. Like, you know, take all your, you know, you got to travel. <laughs> you know, you got to do it that way. You know, like, you know, if you don't travel, it's a sin if you're not traveling. Come on. Um, I like travel, but I definitely think there are moments in which lying on the couch and doing absolutely nothing and watching Goodfellas on TV at 4.30 in the afternoon is just as satisfying yeah. as getting on an airplane and play, airplane going someplace exotic. I think the thing for me that is underlying what the value travel has is that, uh, you know, I make myself nuts trying to find where I'm going to go. I make myself nuts trying to find the hotel room, especially traveling with ki kids now. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Um, everything leading up to the moment is a complete nightmare, but then it's really rare. You get back from somewhere and you say, I wish I didn't do that. Yeah, Never again. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, there have been a few, but almost never. And so in terms of like life experience, I mean, there are plenty of times I go to sporting events where I'm like, never again. I'm not doing that. That was ridiculous. But with travel experiences, you know, it, there's always something, and it does, I feel, it just it, it does open your brain in a way that other experiences don't. You talk about, in the book, about missing the old-fashioned record stores. How these days are you getting music? If you know there's a new album out by somebody you like, how are you getting that? I'm getting it, like any middle-aged person, I'm getting it by a robot algorithm to suggesting that I like this because right. I like that. I mean, that's the sad state of affairs, but... Record stores, and you and I, of course, are around the same age, they performed this incredibly valuable public service, I believe, when we were kids, which was they kind of shamed you. Like, you'd go into record stores, and it didn't even have to be, like, some sort of obscure indie story. There was some pressure at Tower and places like that, too. Um, you developed a taste through that. I remember being sort of embarrassed about the kinds of questions I would ask in record stores or if I didn't know something. And, you know, there's a little bit of obnoxiousness to that for sure. But I think that it, you know, there was a, I, there was this record store that I grew up going to that, you know, there was no way I was going to ever listen to like Elvis Costello had these guys in the store not played Elvis Costello nonstop. Like that was sort of the influence and that the sort of tactile experience of going into the store, lifting up the vinyl, looking on the back, 
I feel bad for kids that they don't have to have that happen again. Now, the, on the flip side of it, they've never had more access to anything in the world. It is Everything. the most amazing thing in the world for me to say to my little boy, like, oh, you want to hear what, you know, Otis Redding sounded like when he was just getting started and literally 0.8 seconds later, it comes right on the, you know, iTunes. Yeah. That's amazing. That's undeniably amazing. But the sort of idea of the actual in-store curation of your taste uh, I feel bad that kids aren't going to be able to experience it. Yeah, I used to go on a Tuesday, and I would buy something, a new release. Yeah. It didn't matter. Uh, I was like, and sometimes I'd be like, I guess I'll get this. Like, I right. felt like I had to buy something to experience something new. Totally. From that week. Totally. And hopefully I heard one of the songs on NEW where I'd be like, oh, I recognize this. I guess I'll get this and hope for the best. I was having this fight at home with my wife about the B-52s. I believe the B-52s were this really cool punk band. People forget that, you know, they went through the thing where they became really popular um, in the 90s, but they were kind of this really out there indie punk band. And some of the early stuff, like, not Rock Lobster, but around that, a really interesting music. We were playing it, and I remember, like, going into the record store uh, in Harvard Square where I was growing up, and like seeing the pictures of the band and they look like Martians to me. And like th- that whole sort of experience of like, who are these people? And then the other thing that you had happen too, which I'm sure it had happened to you, is that remember the times you would buy a record based on one song and then the rest of the record was total dog meat? Yes. I mean, that doesn't really happen anymore because you right. can sample just everything. Buy, or you just buy the yeah, single. That, that happened to me a lot. Like you get home after your seven ninety nine purchase and be like, oh man, but, this is a fastball. But the other thing that, I don't like about it is now you don't, I don't take the chance on a full album and like, I won't sit and listen to the full album. Yeah. Now. I will uh, on Spotify or iTunes. I'll grab the one song or, you know, to, to give an album a full chance, especially like if you bought a cassette in the cassette yeah. days and yeah. the song you knew was the third song in, yeah. you're listening to the first two songs. Not just that, not just that artists. If you talk to artists, they don't make albums in that linear fashion anymore. Yeah. They're not sort of like thinking of, oh, well, this song will progress to this song and this right. part. You know, there are artists who still sort of adhere to that. But by and large, especially as sort of major artists, they don't have to have any sort of contiguous feeling to albums anymore. Right. The whole sort of art of the album experience is definitely on the on the wane. And when you, when you were a kid, did you read Dave Barry, the columnist? I did. You know, I didn't read a lot of it. I'm definitely, of course, you know, familiar with who he is. And, like, I sort of envy, like, the, the career and success he had. And those folks, like, I, I just, that's something that I think is not going to be easily... Um, replaced or imitated because you know he came out of this generation of national syndication what yeah. columns and newspapers yeah, how did that work so he was a miami herald columnist he was a miami herald columnist and i'm not gonna i'm i don't know this for a fact but the way i believe it happens is that you know you develop this reputation you know oh, this is a funny guy in miami we're gonna syndicate his column and so any newspaper around the country for a certain fee can pick up the column and so guys like dave barry or Irma Bombeck, uh, she was another person. You know, they were syndicated everywhere. Everyone and read Dave Barry. Everyone read Irma Bombeck. And then when they would write books, they had a baked-in audience of millions of people around the country who hung on their every word. I mean, it's just an amazing um, business. And besides this podcast, what are some cool places you <laughs> you got to go uh, for this book or, what you, or that you have lined up? Uh, well, I... Um, Jess came from Columbus, Ohio. We were two nights before the big Michigan State game. The place was rocking. Everyone had a little bit to drink. Uh, it was a, a, a night for the Thurber House. It was a James Thurber, uh, you know, humor um, uh, foundation there. And it was an awesome crowd. You know, the best part of these places is that you, I mean, I spent time in San Antonio recently, uh, in Scottsdale, um, you know, in places that I don't ordinarily get to spend a lot of time in. And, there are just all these awesome, friendly, excited readers out there, people who care about the journal. Some of them might have some familiarity with me, but they still care about books and to what you were talking about at the top of the show. You know, like you, I was sort of skeptical about the idea of people reading books anymore. You're like, what's the audience out there? Do people have attention spans anymore? And lo and behold, what's been really awesome is just discovering that there is not just this community of people who still read and still care, but they're thriving. They sort of find each other online. There are all these constituencies of people who recommend books. Um, you know, they just, there's a, there's this active group of people 
who still care deeply about words. And they'll tell it to your face what they like, what they didn't like. You know, they want to know what you like. They want to know what you would recommend. Um, so counter to the idea that I had of publishing being on the way. And again, you work in printed word. People talk about it all the time. Like, what's next? Or is the industry going to be here in 15 years and so on? I, this has made me extremely optimistic about that world because I still think people care. They might process it differently. They might read it on a Kindle. They might read it on their phone even. But they're still caring. And you're somebody who uses Twitter. And it's funny. Sometimes on Twitter, the people you think that are going to be great on Twitter are not great on Twitter because, <laughs> like Howard Stern has even said on the air, yeah. he said, I, I don't get paid to write on Twitter, so I'm not going to write funny stuff on right. Twitter. I'll say funny stuff on my yeah. radio show. Yeah. And I find that sometimes, but you'll write funny stuff on Twitter. Yeah. I, how do you decide I'm going to put this out there or I'm going to save this for something I'm going to get paid to publish? Um, I almost never save something <laughs> to publish. And I'll tell you why. I've used stuff that I've published. And quite honestly, you can use it almost as like a, um, a warm-up. A barometer you know? or a yeah. barometer to see how it yeah, plays. Yeah, so if it's a like funny line about, uh, you know, a, a football game or something like that, like and, and it merits, you know, a reaction, uh, I don't see um, a great deal wrong. I'm not talking you know, we're just, you know, completely reheating like, it, like it's like microwave dinner. Uh, but, you know, like sort of borrowing from your own uh, intellectual property. Um, I, you know, I can't help myself, frankly, with Twitter. You know, it's 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 the instant gratification of reaching an audience and, you know, sort of seeing what people are thinking out there. You know, I go back and forth like I'm sure you do about, you know, what's the proper amount of attention to it? You know, should you be looking at it X times a day? Should you be looking at right. it all the time? Uh, and also I think sometimes like it can be a little bit of a hall of mirrors, right? Like it's like uh, everyone sort of agrees about this and everyone sort of agrees. And, and, and you know, since it's self-selecting, you know, in newsrooms and newspapers, one of the things that every editor you ever have probably says to you at some point is get the hell out of this building and go outside and talk to some r normal people instead of just sitting and talking to other reporters. And I think that's something that you – uh, can fall into a little bit with social media, which I think would be a mistake, which is that I think sometimes, you know, people in our business, we follow other people in the media. You know, that's who we follow. Right. It's like our friends in radio, our friends in TV, our friends at other newspapers and so on. And all of a sudden it's just an echo chamber. We've replaced the interior newsroom with an electronic newsroom and we're just having the same kind of group think conversations and we're not following, you know, ran, you know, so you should follow as diverse a range of people as possible, people who don't necessarily share your opinions, people who might tick you off. I mean, just to get a little bit of that. Now, I'm not saying I do it perfectly by any measure, but I, I it makes me sort of pause sometimes about taking, you know, quote unquote trends or sort of group opinion on Twitter too seriously because it's not always reflective of what it's what the feelings are out there. And the other thing is, if you look at your Twitter analytics, you realize nobody really reads Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> right? You'll have like 40,000 followers, you'll tweet something, and then you'll look, and it'll be like, hey, 6,000 people saw this, nice. It's, and you're like, well, what is everybody else doing? It's 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 amazing. And also, yeah, you just have to assume that uh, yeah, the vast majority of things never, ever connect with people. Right. Um, it's like having, um, it's like your own little movie studio, right? It's like you're putting, wow, that was a bomb. Like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, when you think, oh, this is going to be hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, this, <laughs> man, this is gonna, the opening weekend for this tweet is going to be huge. And it goes, <laughs> so, yeah, like, but but I guess that's, you know, to what Howard Stern was saying, and, you know, we should envy the business of Howard Stern and, and imitate it, but, um, you know, there are no stakes in Twitter. You know, right. like I, I hesitate to say that because obviously there have been stakes for some people who've you get fired some from Twitter. horrible things. Yes. But even that, I don't know how you feel about it, but like I just feel it's like super common sense. I don't think it's like that complicated. I don't think like of social media as some sort of like crazy, like treacherous environment where like if you just say the slightest thing out of whack, all of a sudden you're gonna be, you know, kicked out the door. I don't think it's that. I mean, usually the things that People get in trouble for it. It's like, yeah, well, yes, yeah, so of course. You criticized your coach online in front of millions of people. Yeah, yeah that's actually a bad idea. Yeah. And what is, uh, do, are we right in that uh, writers have a lot of free time during the day, or is that not true? I think that some writers have a lot of free time How during about the day. You? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that honestly, 
I should be using all of my time productively. You don't always have a great distraction social media because you're connecting with people instantly. Um, and to level with you, like I think writers sometimes, especially if you're on the road all the time, it's a little lonely out there. You're sort of like, you know, you're rambling from like, you know, airport to airport and you're kind of disconnected and you're feeling apart from your family or so on. You're like, oh, I can go online and I can say some smack about Rex Ryan and people are going <laughs> to like fire back at me and all of a sudden I'm in an argument. It's kind of exciting, you know? Right. So I think that's a compulsion for people too. I don't feel there are some people and we know many of them, uh, who are agitators and love sort of the back and forth yeah. and like take on trolls and all that kind of stuff. That to me, like I, I can't, like arguing with an egg for a half yeah. an hour. Like I just can't, I can't do I, it. I love watching the internal struggle of Michelle Beadle as she battles the Twitter people. Yeah. Cause she'll go for a long time where she, where she doesn't respond to them. Yeah. Then I think she can't help it. And she just goes all in fighting them and, I, you know, that's I follow her and and with great admiration because she has, you know, taken on people who absolutely deserve to be taken on. But also, as we both know, uh, our complaints about social media, they're less like, you know, they're the complaints of like dilettantes, the, the type of nonsense and outright abuse that women, particularly women in sports media, to, oh, is such a crap it is so horrible and things need to be done and the social media companies need to be interceding i just think it's repulsive and i it's it makes me embarrassed for the not just the profession but for the universe that the type of venom and you know response that just for it's just it's obnoxious and so my respect to anybody who is fighting the good fight against it because it's just unacceptable agreed Jason, thank you for coming on the podcast. This is Little Victories, Perfect Rules for Imperfect Living. I feel like I've accomplished something in reading this book in that I can put this on my shelf now and go, I read that. I, that You know what? When it comes out in paperback, can we get that on yeah. the front cover? I read This is the first book I read uh, since Private Part. Yeah, since Aldous. Private Part. Because I even had a time when, when Hurricane Sandy was happening, I had no power where I lived for, <laughs> for seven days. And I did. I had no power and I still didn't read a book. So you kind of like just sat there like early man, like <laughs> I was in the like cave. listening to news on my, you know, a transistor radio. And yeah. I had these books yeah. on my shelf that I did not read. And it yeah. was daytime when I was home. Yeah. And I still didn't read them. Well, the saddest thing is like if you're on an airplane and for whatever reason your phone craps out or something yeah. and you're like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, look at this magazine. What is this? Like the Stone Age? <laughs> like what do people do? Yeah. So this is a great book for that. And I recommend no books, but this one I recommend. <laughs> Thank you. Little victories. Thank you, Jason.